So I hope that everyone's eaten their sea urchins for the day. So we're going to be talking about Salvador Dali and his book 50 Secrets to Magic Craftsmanship, written in 1947. And I thought this was an interesting text because it's a lot of different books all in one. It's a how-to manual, it's a self-help book of sorts, and it's also an artist book. And so I'm going to go through all these different things and a little bit of the history and what I found in my research of all of them and uh, help that hopefully that'll give you some more insight into what exactly is happening with Dali and this very strange how-to book. So I started off with by going back this is the farthest back that I could find which was Da Vinci's Codex Urbinus and this was a series of drawings that had been done on notebook pages and <clears throat> all of them had the heading on top on painting. So Da Vinci himself was writing a lot about painting and his approach to painting and he was trying to make a scientific argument for art making. So they had a lot of writing in them. He had these, you know, crazy um, Latin written from right to left, of course, which almost makes it, you know, some sort of mysterious type of text that we have to try and discern. Um, but he also created a lot of these different diagrams, like you can see this dodecohedron up here, and Lord knows what he's talking about. But a lot of this had to do with, of course, Renaissance, and science was becoming um, codified into art with things like perspective. So there were mathematical ways to make a two-dimensional plane seem three-dimensional. There were other things that he came up with, simply things like atmospheric perspective, which is, you know, you look at the horizon and things get a little bit bluer and hazier as you go towards the horizon. And this is because there's water in the air. And so there were scientific and provable claims that could be made in these books or these entries, but they were also kind of the artist making things up as he went along himself. So <clears throat> I think it's a, a nice early piece which shows an artist who is creating things, documenting the way he's creating them, and also trying to create something that can be made for other people. Even though these were notebooks, they're not really like diary, diary entries because we have to imagine that you know Da Vinci knew that other people would be interested in his techniques and these sort of things. So um, these were later compiled into a book, as it says here, um, and people would read them to try and discern Da Vinci's techniques and also improve their own techniques. Then we come to A. Bugert, and this guy is, uh, he was a Dutch artist, and he made an entire book all about mixing watercolors. And he did this simply by taking a color and then simply mixing it with another color and adding different amounts of water to it. So it's a really, really simple process. You get an orange and then you maybe you add one more part yellow to it and one drop of water. And then you make another orange and you add two parts yellow to it and two drops of water. And so <clears throat> he methodically did every color that he possibly could and he came up with 800 pages of color and writing about how to create all these different variations of tone and value and these sort of things. Um, so while it's a very simple idea, in the end it becomes kind of this extraordinary feat and it just shows you know how many colors are out there, so to speak. Of course this you know preceded Pantone and that idea by about 300 years. 
So it's also important in this in this instance, he only made one of these books, obviously, because he had to um, you know make watercolor on every single page and there weren't printing processes advanced enough to duplicate all these colors. So he only made one copy of this book, but um, it was said, he, he said that it was created for educational purposes. So he saw this book as being something which could be used to teach other people how to paint. And I can't really imagine this approach to artwork, but I imagine um, being a Dutch artist with Dutch still lifes and Dutch landscapes also coming into their own during the same time, that this would be something that those artists would really perhaps cling on to, this type of approach to drawing. From here we go to, I'm kind of jumping around in time a little bit here, <clears throat> but we had one reading from James Elkins. And painting, you know, this method of like adding one drop of water and two parts of blue and all this sort of stuff, it has this kind of scientific approach, but it can be probably compared more to alchemy. And because alchemy also has this kind of mystical element to it, and it also has people testing stuff and people experimenting and trying to create new substances that have never been created before. And, you know, of course, create gold out of uh, lead. <clears throat> so to create something valuable out of something not so valuable is, is the whole intention of alchemy. So we can think of a lot of these early manuscripts about painting and drawing and how to, almost as a type of alchemy, where the, the artist themselves is put into a position where they're the expert on it, and they're telling people, even if it's all self-taught, um, they're telling people their methods, which might seem absolutely ridiculous. Um, of course, this relates to Dali's 50 Magic um, Secrets to Magic Craftsmanship, it relates to this in the sense that often these texts would talk about, you know, taking ultramarine blue and holding it on a knife blade in a fire for five minutes on a full moon or something like that. <clears throat> and that's how you get, you know, the perfect type of blue. So there was often these strange rituals that accompanied painting for, for many, many years. And the idea of a secret, of course, and we have, you know, 50 magic secrets, was also something um, that a lot of alchemists would have employed. So the idea that they're creating these, these methods that they should also keep secret, and then the published book is a sort of um, compendium of all these ideas in one place. It's worth noting that the next book Elkins wrote after this um, was called Why Art Cannot Be Taught. So here we have a book, and it even says on the right-hand side here, a handbook for art students. And it's just kind of strange to have a guidebook or a handbook that is, you know, antithetical to its intention of the user who probably has bought it. So meaning that the user themselves wants to get a book that tells them the secrets, that tells them how to paint, that tells them what they're supposed to do, and this will make their life a lot easier. But in this book, we see that books trying to claim to tell you the right answers about how to do things aren't going to be able to do that completely. You know, So not all the solutions are ever going to be found in a book. So these books themselves can become something else, right, altogether. And that brings us to the idea of artist books and William Blake. And here with, with Blake, we're in, um, let me look up. I don't have the date here. But um, William Blake kind of starts off the idea 
that a book can be illustrated and drawn by the same person. And so <clears throat> these were books that were also poetry. This isn't exactly a self-help book of any type. But these are, are books that are kind of becoming something else. The book itself is an artistic piece. And so while all these pages could you know, be seen as works of art that all hang on the wall, they're actually seen as pages in a book, and we're supposed to interact with them as a book. We can look also to the Russian uh, construction, constructivists. Here we see some early art books by Natalia Goncharova and Mikhail Larinov. And uh, in these books, you can see that there, you know, a lot of handwriting and then illustrations that are done in the margins. And these things together create something that is all the artist's hand. So it's a glimpse into their notebook of sorts, but it's meant to be an artistic piece altogether. So I think these types of books are an interesting way to look at how do artists deal with the idea of combining text and image. And this was often done um, in these artistic books. So this is 1912. I think it's interesting to note, bouncing back and forth in time, how this would influence uh, zine culture later on. We can see these are quite similar in a way to the layout in this black and white approach to the page. And here on the left we have Mike Kelly's uh, Destroy All Monsters zine that he made with Jim Shaw and some other people, and just another random zine uh, that I found on the internet. But again, we have the handwritten text, we have illustrations and text all living together happily, and these things create a new work of art that is a, an artistic piece in itself. In addition to going back to the 1920s or so, yeah, here's 1921, George Gross, there was a lot of pamphleteering, pamphleting, I guess you could say. Um, there was a lot of pamphleting going on, and People were creating artist books that contained caricatures and cartoons that were pushing a sort of political ideology of some sort. So these types of ideologies were obviously influenced by Marx in, in the early days. And um, here we have George Gross's The Face of the Ruling Class, where we see these kind of plutocrats at the top who are seen as fat and, you know, pulling the strings of everybody else. So creating these books were, was seen as a, a very distinctly political act. Here we've got some of Max Ernst's uh, collages, On Semaine de Bonté, 1934. Again, this is an artistic book that's created. It's got poetry in it, and all of these images and the person would look at these poetry and these images and see that it's, it's an artist creating the entire package um, all together. So that would be another example which I think is kind of pertinent when discussing Dali's. Also in the late 1920s, we see a proliferation of different how-to-draw books that are very straightforward in nature, obviously like Publishing around 1920 or so becomes super um, available to everybody. Books become uh, mass marketed. And with that, we see the rise of these types of how to draw books. So in this image, we can see the horizon line is always on a level with the observer's eyes. And it's just kind of a ridiculous picture. But again, it's trying to tell us something about how we're supposed to see and how we're supposed to draw. And sometimes, here's the one from the 1880s, 1890s, How to Draw and Paint book. And I think the, the images contained in it are actually kind of, you know, surrealistic in some ways. Andrew Loomis uh, was super important to the creation of a lot of these drawings. 
And he took an approach which simply broke the figure down into these giant planes. And for that, he's still remembered today. Another thing associated with Loomis is the rise of the step-by-step. -step. So here we can see on the left, you know, the figure, how the figure is slowly constructed. How the planes of the face are broke up. How the eyes work. You know, it's telling us all about the human body and how to create it. These methods are still used today. In this, we can see Loomis's how to draw a head on one side. And here is a, one of the most famous YouTube tutorial, um, drawing tutorial guys, Proko. And he's just ripping off Loomis pretty much directly. If you look at this video, it's directly from this. And Loomis is also still super important today. He's taught quite often. Draw comic faces, the oval method you can see here. Looking at these types of faces contrasted against Dali's more um, amorphous and blobby. You know, this is an impossible task. It has something to do with how you're supposed to eat um, with your wife. And so contrasting this sort of a text, artistic against these comic faces. Also, we it's kind of worth noting the whole self-help in industry starts to take off in the 1930s. A lot of people hate self-help and everything to do with it. But these books are also purporting some sort of like a magical secret often. You can see here with the most popular one, The Secret um, and Magic. <coughs> it's also talking about these secret things that you can do yourself. So the idea is that the person reading the book isn't just, you know, getting into the head of somebody else. They're also engaging in carrying out these tasks that are going to bring magic and success into their life. Thinking of these things also brings up the idea of snake oil salesmen. So people, are they, know, are they a charlatan? You know, do they know what they're selling is absolute nonsense? And self-help has a lot of critics lately, and it's been said to reinforce perceptions of inferiority. It's another form of avoidance. Creates unrealistic ex expectations, not scientifically validated. Self-help is a contradiction. With that, we go to um, some of the videos that became more and more popular and in more recent times tutorials how to and this approach brings us to people like Bob Ross and people that tend to watch these I think want some sort of relaxation to accompany them and they're painting as a way to get that relaxation in their life. How to of course is one of the most uh, popular things on the internet and it also has created a situation where people are saying, no, these how-tos and these tutorials are absolute nonsense, and these videos don't necessarily create good art of any type. They create art that's meant to be recreated a thousand times. So in this, we can take a quick look at how to paint a realistic eye. And in that painting, we see that the entire method and the ideas of how to create um, and I are completely subverted and played with. And the tutorial itself becomes um, something that can be plugged into, something that can be used and exploited in different ways to create something completely new. Also related, we have Let's Paint TV. And Let's Paint TV... Here this guy is um, painting, making on a treadmill, and blending drinks all at the same time. This is a show that was popular in California in the late 1990s on cable access. And um, again, we have this absurdist approach to art making that I think, and it's kind of a how-to thing. So we're watching it, and it's a how-to, it's a tutorial but it's become something completely different in itself. It's become almost like a, a type of performance art. 
in and of itself. Now, the final thing I guess I want to touch on is the actual um, content within um, what he's talking about. And in, in the section that you guys wrote, the person sits on a chair, he has a key in their hand, he drops the she or he drops the key, and then they paint immediately you know, what was in their head at that time. So this actually was a method that was used by some people, but it was kind of more the, the idea of separating yourself from your body completely and not being the artist. So it's a bit of death of the artist uh, or death of the author in a way that the surrealists were saying they, they were not creating the work. They didn't want to create the work themselves. So uh, I just put in a couple other artists who, who actually use these surrealist techniques developed by Dali in, in the creation of their work. So here we have Toyens, um, phantom images, and these were often created um, by like smearing a canvas um, with paint and then looking at it and finding some objects within it, or also doing an etching on a floorboard or something like that and then working from that. Here we have Hans Bellmer on the left, and he would you know, coat a piece of glass with different paint and then smack that onto a canvas and then pull the glass off to create these types of effects. And on the right, we have Max Ernst's frottage, which was to you know, rub textures. Yves Tangi also used it to create his works. And there's Dali with his anteater. And so, yeah, it's kind of about, you know, going back to Let's Paint TV, it's difficult to figure out what Dolly's intentions were with these works. Was he intentionally crazy or not? We don't know. Um, or is it all just a performance piece? Is this complete nonsense? Or is this him actually talking about, you know, sea urchins and putting their eyes in his hands and this sort of stuff? That could be possible. Um, I just, in my research, I I learned that Salvador Dali's writings and uh, personality test he had taken were analyzed by a computer program, and he was found to have this cluster B personality disorder of some sort. But I just thought it was kind of amazing that a computer was diagnosing a dead person. And that's pretty much all I've got for you. So... On the face of it, it's kind of a poetic, poetry-type piece that may make not make a lot of sense, but I suppose, I guess the argument I would like to make is how does one create a how-to book um, that actually is honest? Is that even possible? Thank you.